I have with me um, Shubhendu Koche, who is uh, based out of uh, Singapore. Shubhendu has actually spent uh, time at companies like Philips, NXP, um, MX, and Mastercard, and is uh, a payments in mobility payments, uh, especially in transit pay, uh, which is um, uh, you know the topic of discussion today. Um, so the reason that we are doing uh, this particular series focused on uh, you know transit payments and the opportunities therein is because of uh, various reasons such as the transit pay is in terms of just the sheer size is actually bigger than even retail payments many people don't realize um, i think the payment nerds definitely sort of know about it and that there are uh, significant developments which are happening in the space which provide a lot of opportunity right so so if you see that the whole sort of ticketing systems and transit pay is um, uh, is kind of fragmented. It has lots and lots of different, uh, you know, options and diversity. For example, public transport operators, you know, starting from rail, metro, bus, monorails, you know, undergrounds, what have you. And then there are different types of ticketing systems. There are different types of tickets. And then, you know, from cash, it has gone to cards, online payments, mobile wallets, uh, you know, store value cards, smart cards, you know, tap and go. Uh, so we wanted to actually explore this uh, space much deeper and who better than to start with Shubrindu, who is also a senior advisor at Medici. Uh, followed by this, we will also have uh, five videos done with um, transit payment experts from across the world, from UK, Netherlands, India, and Singapore. So before I start, um, uh, Shubrindu, welcome uh, to this uh, video series. Thank you, Amit. Glad to be here. Great. So maybe we can just uh, sort of jump right in and I can, uh, you know, actually sort of start by asking you how big is actually transit payments? Is it like as, as, as kind of I understand, uh, but I don't have the exact data. Is it bigger than retail payments? If you look at the total volume of transactions, uh, think about the number of cities that run transportation, mass commute as a train or a bus in some form and look at whether it is cash pace or some ways running on cards or some digital form. So if you look at uh, the developed markets, yes, it is almost as big as e-commerce or even bigger than e-commerce. In terms of the dollar size, it may not be as big because the average ticket size is much smaller than your retail basket. But in terms of frequency, it more than makes up for it. So if you make a comparison between 120 cities which are running mass transit today. If you look at China alone, you've got mass transit running on some form of digital mobile uh, contactless technology uh, since 2013. And you have more than 35 cities that are live. So imagine the number of people that are using this payment mechanism every day. And I like the way that we are calling it transit pay because for so many years, we were calling it ticketing. We were not even willing to call it payments because uh, it was seen as a very different ecosystem running on very different rails. And the payments has now gradually started diffusing with that world. So I think that diffusion and crossover is something that's really very exciting. Back to you, Amit. Right. So it's very interesting. Few of the things you said. I think when it was called ticketing, and people used to say transportation technology and all that. I think um, that's the reason why fintech startups and fintech founders and generally the tech industry was not so excited about it for you know decades together. And we only saw large companies like you know from one end you know NXP and Philips of the world to you know uh, uh, traditional sort of payments tech companies like MasterCard, et cetera, being in this space. But now I'm seeing, especially, I mean, some smaller fintech companies, but especially the big tech companies are kind of very interested in this. And I think I've, I've seen a fascinating trend about uh, big tech companies that they don't want to build the core infrastructure themselves or, you know, the compliance headache themselves they don't want to deal with. But once in any industry, like sort of, sort of in retail payments with things like UPI, and now in uh, transit payments with um, some of the core infrastructure being built and being, uh, made open, I think the big tech companies are actually very, very interested in um, uh, in this space, which is good news. 
although i think during this covid-19 crisis i i think this this is a weird time to actually discuss about transit payments because people are kind of you know, traveling less but i guess this is also the time to build and that's why we thought of sort of starting the series because i think this is the time to get ready when the markets open up so essentially in that uh, context you know, i wanted to ask you uh, why were transport ticketing and you know retail payments considered different for so long right why are why are transit payments becoming more important now sure oh. so uh, before i jump on to the historical narrative uh, we all hope that we'll get on to that bus we'll take the train uh, very soon and riderships will grow because uh, uh, this is not the normal situation that we have it is an aberration so uh, we will get back to normalcy uh, hopefully soon but if you take a look back on transportation trains metros buses the way it evolved is you had big cities starting from asia like japan like korea creating the need for putting these large number of people through from one point to the other point through the bus system through the train system in a fast and efficient way and you had to collect the right amount of fare so what was available at that point were early forms of closed loop and contactless was coming up these were early days of both a uh, felica in japan and what we called myfair in europe and then you started following this industry nomenclature of the iso standards so everybody from the industry knows uh, iso 13443 so that became the holy grail then you had type a and type b so the industry in a way fragmented itself so that was a uh, undoing of the industry for a long time because it was not able to adopt a global standard like emv did for the pure retail payments but it's also important to understand that once you had these closed loop uh, systems that grew within the same city and it's important to understand that the infrastructure was being laid out either by funds from the city government or the federal government or through long term soft loans infrastructure grants from other foreign donor companies so when you had infrastructure coming in uh, in a big way the ticketing from that country started coming as a gift together with the infrastructure so that's how you saw uh, the japanese uh, almost like a beta max to the european vhs uh, coming in and spreading into hong kong into singapore into indonesia into india initially but it was again a kind of a beta max because in terms of the throughput in terms of the data reliability in terms of the security it was far superior no doubt about it but in terms of the cost base it was not that great so the transit authorities were always at a dilemma how to handle this so on one hand you had a smaller supply base from japan but on the other hand you had a much wider supply base from the rest of europe from the rest of uh, continental europe primarily from germany and france and so they devised a way of saying hey let's make our reader infrastructure the terminal infrastructure the validators that you see on the buses the gates that you see on the metro stations universal now what it means is they had to support all of these three different variants the iso 14443 type a type b and also the felica which was also called type c legally uh, but there's no type c formally but it became calling uh, as type c so uh, the industry got fragmented that was one of the main reasons then if you look at the ownership of the different infrastructure these were granted as concessionaries to uh, private sector or to government linked businesses in many cases so within the same city you had situation that for every different line you required a different transport card now if you walk back uh, 7 or 8 years back to delhi when delhi metro started could you use a delhi metro card on a dtc bus or vice versa now that sounded counterintuitive to the who probably took a bus to get to the station and again from the station took a bus so the ride got fragmented as well so that has kept back uh, what we typically call transit payments from becoming a fully mainstream payments use case till now but now that's all changing right so that's a great explanation and we have seen it uh, you know across financial services that 
proprietary technology basically creates a lot of fragmentation and then once you know the the regulators the market starts opening up the infrastructure you know what it could lead to right so that's the change that we are seeing in uh, retail payments as well as now in transit payments as well so so thanks for that uh, i also wanted to understand that in this current covid 19 crisis and this context will transit payments make a comeback once mass transit recovers uh, what it do you absolutely see? will it absolutely will because if you look at the nature of the commuters on any public uh, transportation network today whether that's a metro or a brt system or even a, a fragmented uh, auto or a jeepney uh, you will see that there are the regular habitual commuters who will take out a season pass for instance wherever it's available you would have the occasional who would ditch their uh, scooter their motorcycle their car once or twice a week and then there you would have uh, the concessionary travelers the students the elderly people who have uh, special concessions like in singapore the ns national service uh, active uh, ns men so you have a plethora of fare tables and what you need to charge right so historically it was over engineered for profitability because the costs of running the system were very high so you needed to extract every dollar every cent from the fare collection system but the inherent cost of issuing these closed loop cards of having the infrastructure to top up or reload these cards was very expensive so if you look at the single journey tickets like uh, if you remember you used to have these blue tokens in uh, delhi metro now what happens if you take them home and give it away or keep it under the pillow the metro system actually loses money so to save the money they will charge you some deposit on it so that they are covering their cost in case the coin or the token doesn't come back into the system but if you look at the different use cases of the commuters if you look at whether the fare was fixed or variable the fare structure or something like the rating engine that a telco uses was very very complicated and it was very very rigid because all of the intelligence was between your card so something like this uh, easylink card in singapore or something like the touch and go card in malaysia or one of the most uh, popular examples the oyster card in london yeah so a lot of intelligence had to be built into these readers so first uh, imagine that you had to support three different variants of the technology to talk to a card on top of that you had proprietary ways of talking and doing the key exchange with these cards then the area of the card where you would be storing your application or your data is also different so all of that meant that the integration was very proprietary took more than it should have in terms of the money and the time and these contracts were given out to traditional i would say a dozen system integrators who were deploying this over a 2 to 3 year period and they used to run these over 12 to 15 year contracts which meant that leave aside any integration with a third party over a api you could not even change one line of code in that system once it is out in the field so you are looking at something that used to change once in a decade once in a 15 years to something that's now opening up just like banking is to open api so that's a tremendous generational shift that you see all around us right i mean looking at those cards i mean it brought back memories of pre covid times when we used to use the octopus card and <laughs> oyster card and um, i i think uh, one of the things i've realized is that uh, developed markets and developing markets might be very different when it comes to transit payments so maybe that's a good segue into that topic i think developed worlds um, you know especially with a lot of nfc infrastructure you know a very high penetration of payment cards uh, you know your sort of you know big tech companies having uh, launched their you know including apple pay what do you like how do you see uh, the developments in developed market are there some dominant form factors like you know smartphones versus wristbands versus smart watch can you describe a little bit about what's happening in in the in, in those markets So oh, so in the developed markets the good news was they started early the bad news is they started early so the equipment is already uh, outdated and 
is going through a lot of refresh cycles. But the good part again is that they've got big masses of city residents who are used behaviorally to tapping. So transit becomes a killer app for any payments ecosystem, not only because you've got the average man and woman on the street using it, but also because you tend to use it very often. Because when you go in, you also come out, right? So you almost uh, use it 2x times for every transaction. So in a developed market where you have a deeper penetration of a card, whether that's a credit card or a debit card being issued from a bank, you have a better chance of digitalizing those cards on a mobile form factor or a portable form factor like a smart watch or a wristband. If you look at the developing markets, this infrastructure is still coming up. Yes, you have uh, traditional uh, infrastructure that had been laid out in Japan, in Australia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, but there are over 60 cities today that are laying out new infrastructure going from an empty blackboard and then they can craft their own story. So what you're seeing is a more open but lighter way of creating the acceptance or this reader infrastructure, which means that in addition to the contactless interface, they are supporting the visual, the barcode or the QR code through a combination of the reader technologies, right? So you get combo readers, which are not that expensive, that can accept anything that you throw at them. The second point is that the retail banks in emerging markets who have a smaller penetration of credit, a bit higher, but still not a mass market penetration of debit, are also looking at playing a bigger role in cooperating with the transit authorities and transit operators. Because if you look at the classical Western world, many of the largest transport authorities are also the operators on their own rights. In many parts of the emerging Asia, even developed Asia, you see that the transit authority is a separate body. The transit operator is a separate body. And sometimes the entity that is uh, accredited to acquire the transit payments is a separate body altogether, maybe linked to the operator, but it is carved out as a separate line of business. So you have the flexibility of creating interesting business models that started out with uh, the likes of Kochi in India are getting more popular, where the bank comes up and says, hey, we understand this is a big cost space for you. In return for running the show on the payments, can you give us some exclusivity or a lead time? And in many cases, the transit operators and the banks are able to reach an agreement on saying, hey, the bank through its partners will take care of the transit, make sure that it is open, interoperable, supports even the closed loop cards. And again, on the closed loop cards, you're seeing some of the transit operators opting in for a EMV system, which is the common standard from payments, but using the private label EMV because they are strong brands and they also expanded into non-retail payments over the last 10, 15 years. So it's not very easy for them to be dislodged. They already have the merchant relationships, especially if you look at the small merchants that are in the footprint of a one kilometer to two kilometer radius of a train station or a bus stop, you will see that this is the most dense acceptance area for these transit closed loop cards. So there is a hybrid environment where these closed loop cards will coexist with the open loop cards and what in, uh, the second level of change that you're seeing is that there is a more acceptance of the open loop uh, payments because it is more friendly to visitors. So imagine you go to a new city, you don't know which car to buy, you stand in a queue, you've taken a long flight. It's a bad user experience because right out of a long uh, haul flight, you have to stand in the queue again. So wouldn't it be nice to pay for the fare with anything that you have in your wallet and it should work. So what you are seeing in the developed markets are some form of a hybrid application plus card so that the card still belongs to the operator, but the mobile app is able to top it up. So there were very interesting cases in New Zealand that Snapper did where you could top up your uh, closed loop card with a normal phone 
And I think that was a great segue into mass market transit. But I still feel that the contactless cards, the contactless EMV cards are here to stay because it's just so uh, popular. It's not uh, liable to breakage. And remember, you're trying to push almost uh, 15 to 20 people through a gate every minute. So the yeah. transaction time is you know, very stringent, especially in markets like Japan. Remember the Felica story. So best technology, shortest transaction time, you can put people through the gate in less than a, a second. Of course, people don't move that far, but the transaction happens in less than 250 uh, to 200 milliseconds. But globally, you can still do that complete payment transaction in between 500 to 800 milliseconds. So uh, in the emerging markets, I see a bigger collaboration between banks and the transit operators crafting out deals based on the amount of data that is being generated. Because if you look at the quantum of data, what it tells you about the behavior of the commuters, what it tells the city authorities about the flow of traffic, how even a rideshare platform can then position its supply to match a spike in demand at different transit points is very interesting. So Singapore has been driving that uh, for some time with great success and also has been creating this open data pool, uh, which is available to third parties. So I think that is a example where you will see the transit operators still being uh, at the center, crafting out partnerships with retail banks and the fintechs coming in more in terms of opening the API so that you can buy a credential to ride from any wallet that you have, from any phone that you have, and then also be able to uh, use the incentive or the nudging structure of public transportation. So many cities grapple with uh, peak hour rush hour traffic. So can you incentivize travelers by reducing the fare to the shoulders of that peak hour? Or can you nudge them to take the bus if the train line is not working for a few hours. So right. all of those become very interesting because you can now have these alerts sent back to the commuters and you can do a very flexible way of charging them. So right. think about how a telco is offering you plans. What's stopping a transit operator to offer you similar plans? Right. So so just to sort of uh, uh, you know pick up like a couple of points there. So we will. So I, I think you made a very interesting point about transportation technology, transit payments, uh, the data coming out of it, and how it can be interlaced with, um, you know, the traffic situation and you know ride sharing and so on and so forth, which leads us into the whole smart cities discussion, uh, which we'll come to in a, in a bit. Um, I, I wanted to also kind of you know um, just double tap on developing markets and because they're very interesting in in the way that not only the transportation infrastructure is more, uh, you know, it's, it's fresher, um, or some people say it's weaker, uh, but also the payments infrastructure in some way or the other, especially countries like India is way ahead of, you know, sort of developed markets, right? Especially with the platforms like UPI. Now, um, when you look at something like a national common mobility card, the NCMC card, uh, you know, which has been launched in India, and the role that sort of you know NPCI plays as a product management function. What do you think about that? Is is that a very good way of kind of dealing with this? Uh, you know, it would be very interesting for the audience to know. So, uh, transportation in India has had a few starts, a few halts, but it's taken these strides. So it's taken longer than what everybody thought. But I think we are getting there because when we look at transit, it's not only the buses and the trains in the city. It's also the toll. It's also the parking. So I think what has happened now, which is great, is that the authorities which are responsible for the payments are also the authorities which are responsible for the infrastructure. So now there is an alignment of interest between who is regulating the sector. Earlier, you had different ministries who were responsible for different parts of the equation. So nobody had the full view. So the National Common Mobility Card has been talked about for the last 12 years, at least. It stagnated for a few years when uh, uh, the conditions were still not uh, opportune. 
I see that the academia in India played a pioneering part. There was a lot of uh, absorption of the international standards coming in from both the payment brands as well as the standardization bodies like EMV. Also, a uh, localization of going a uh, more prepaid focused rather than a pure credit focused. Because if you look at majority of the commuters, they would be looking at a fair collection system that accepts uh, coins, cash, prepaid, and doesn't give them a big burden of carrying credit. Right. So now what you're seeing is a way of the intelligence that handles the fair media and the reader getting decoupled from that physical point of interaction, which means that as long as you can create an account in the backend, whether that's based on your bank uh, PAN card number or whether it is based on your uh, Aadhaar card number or whether it is based on some hash of a interoperable ID, you can have almost like an access control mechanism with a cloud-based fair computation engine. So the complexity of the reader infrastructure, the complexity of the card goes down because look at it more like an access control that you use to enter your uh, apartment or enter your office. And then the intelligence to say, hey, how much should you be charged is sitting on the cloud. And now since the payment industry has also changed the way that it authorizes these transactions, the way these transactions get aggregated, you can do something which is very similar to a telco model. So that becomes both a kind of a prepaid, but the benefits of a postpaid in terms of flexibility of plans, campaigns, marketing uh, rewards being applied to transit. So I do believe that uh, A, treating it together with parking and toll, treating this with a kind of uh, account-based infrastructure, but still focusing on people who will prefer a prepaid is the right way to go. And then once you have a UPI uh, pull, then you could do a lot of magic with these schemes. Right. So it's fascinating. I, I know that you spent time in the telco industry as well. And uh, one of my favorite uh, sort of lines in FinTech from a FinTech founder is from uh, Roger Desai, who is the founder of Payphone. Uh, they just raised a hundred million dollars. So he, he always said that the FinTech industry should look at um, a place for payments and, and uh, other stuff um, in a way that how phone calls happen. And when you're making a phone call, um, you never think about which operator are you working with and which operator is the person you're calling and whether it's a local call or an international call, it's seamless. You don't have to do any face ID or anything. You just, you just dial a number, right? So I think as we are kind of progressing in fintech and payments, uh, I, I completely sort of agree with you that telco is, is kind of a, a great model, especially the phone call. And that actually leads me into my next question about, um, so, so, you know, I, I think earlier you were talking about how transportation technology, transit pay, traffic, toll, all this data which is emerging, you know, how it relates to fintech, ride sharing and all that. So let's talk about the smart cities, where it leads to how does, how does this fit into the overall narrative of a smarter, responsive, uh, you know, city? So there's a often quoted uh, uh, phrase from uh, the mayor of uh, Bogota in Colombia, who said a smart city or an advanced city is not where the poor have a car, but where even the rich take a bus or a train. So I think that sums it up quite nicely because A, you're looking at the carbon emissions, B, you're looking at the congestion on the roads, C, you're looking at the quality of life, and also you're looking at uh, creating an infrastructure that is equitable to all, right? So when you look at the way that uh, the fragmented lines, the bus sector, the MRT system is now coming together, it forms one half of a typical journey. Because if you look at the mega cities now, typically you may still continue driving your own vehicle up to a given point, park it somewhere outside the CBD area, the central business district area, then take the train or the bus. And then if you're going out for a lunch, you may take a ride share with your colleagues you may hop on to a Uber or a Grab or a Gojek. So you need to uh, now fix this multimodal commute because look at the way Uber 
worked across countries yeah. if i was paying cash if i was paying through my link debit or a credit card i could take a ride in any foreign country and still take a commute from point a to point b so yeah. now what you are seeing is that the ability to buy the credentials for a bus ride or a train ride are getting subsumed using these apis into other platform providers now would it be a ride share provider or would it go directly into the home screen of your operating system essentially your apple or a google it will be very interesting to see how that sector moves but essentially what you're saying is i can plan i can see the options i can decide which option to take and then i can pay for the whole ride at one go so the entire concept of mobility as a service means whatever i need to do and pay when i want to go from point a to point b is taken care of at one point now how these different service providers are going to share up and divvy up that uh, fare is now something that requires the smarts right because now you are again doing an apportionment so in the traditional transport world you built up these big monolith central clearing houses that used to say hey if the ride looks like uh, point a to point b to point c to point d within a given point of time this is the way that we'll split the money that we collected into the three traffic operators now imagine it's not just the bus train ferry it's also your uber it's also your electric scooter so how is the city going to handle it because the interesting part is that just as we said look 19th century was the century of empires 20th century is the century of the nation states the 21st century as a unit of economic activity belongs to these mega cities so if you look at the contribution to a country's gdp from the mega city area that is called the capital let's say manila or jakarta it's a big chunk of the total country's gdp right so all of these payment ecosystems will start out from the city areas and then subset will move to the smaller towns uh, which are uh, contributing to uh, the gdp but not to the same extent as this densely packed uh, city that would have typically uh, 15 to 25 million of people of which half will take the commute every day so if you look at the statistics even from markets like uh, korea the number of daily passengers that take the train and buses in korea is north of 30 million if you look at even uh, cities like pune which is now planning for its uh, integrated uh, transit system it's going to be north of a couple of million so if you look at the opportunity of how many people are taking this ride every day and paying for it it's a massive opportunity right And Shubhendu, as you know very well, you have been sort of involved with Medici right from the beginning. That we care a lot about fintech space and what can startups do uh, and what are the opportunities for them. So, uh, very quickly, you know, if you could summarize, what are the opportunities for startups or fintechs in this space? Uh, I think uh, the transit infrastructure is hard. Uh, you don't want to start building the next boom gate uh, because you would be competing against those who are making. Hundred thousand of those gates. So the economy of scale is not there. But what is very interesting is to look at this open API model and how do you convince the transit authority or the operator to open it up to you? How do you make sure that the different wallet providers are now connecting to that inventory of uh, rides, to that capacity of seats, to that uh, required credential being passed on to the transit operator? through you so can you be that digital platform that's one part secondly can you get these big parts of the physical environment the bus stop the train stations the actual buses and the trains themselves to become more ad tech so to give you an example transport for london is the biggest out of home advertiser in london today but can it distinguish how many people are looking at the kiosk or at the holding in one station versus the other can it dynamically price the brands for its advertising then the big part is retail payment especially a common merchant experience is driven by the value exchange 
you get something back in terms of rewards of loyalty points how many times have you seen a transit operator giving you a reward or a loyalty point but given a choice wouldn't it be a great idea to say hey buy 10 packs of something and your next bus ride is free because obviously if you're not taking the bus somebody in the family is and they will make use of that inventory yeah so so a lot of opportunities for fintech from you know as as the infrastructure is opening up from edtech perspective there's a lot of real estate for advertisements there's rewards and uh, you know coupling and all that uh, opportunities as well now my last question you know we are sort of running out of the time contract but um, just my last question in terms of very quickly if you could tell what are the, what are your three top predictions uh, you know for this space over the next few years so i do believe that uh, you will see the open loop account based ticketing uh, come up in many more cities especially driven by the resurgence of uh, travel and cross border because uh, today it's a big pain having to queue up at a city uh at the airport to convert your money in a way into the local casino that uh, uh, are effectively the casino chips of that city's transit system what i do see is the business model between retail banks slash telcos and transit operators completely turning the business upside down with this kind of uh, uh, paying a royalty to the transit operator in return for the advertising in terms of the marketing rights and then the payments becomes one part of this complete equation between the two and what i also see is this further decoupling between uh, the payment into access control and fair calculation on the cloud so you will see more such transit systems the fair collection part happening in the cloud and depending on some city level region level state level or country level id system which can be hashed pseudonymized and then made sure that uh, there is no privacy that is being breached right thank you so much shubhendu this was a fascinating discussion probably my best discussion in terms of sort of transit payments i learned so much from you uh, i am sure this will be worthwhile for the audience as well and i i would like to remind again that this is a series we are going to also talk to five other experts from all over the world which will be led by shubhendu and we are talking to people in netherlands uk india singapore so get a very sort of wider perspective on on opportunities in transit payments um uh, with this we would like to end the session thank you everyone for joining us bye bye thank you amit